We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So hello everyone and welcome to uh, this workshop. Um, it focuses on a um, point of discussion that I would like us to have, uh, which is where disinformation and cybersecurity could meet um, and why they should meet. Uh, so a few housekeeping rules before we begin. We are in a hybrid session, so it comes with its own challenges. Um, uh, of people, you know, being in person uh, in Poland and other being um, online from elsewhere. Um, so Lucien, who is on site there doing stuff with his um, phone, <laughs> um, he will be helping me um, collect and address questions from the people who are uh, on site. And we'll be having other questions from participants online, uh, which I invite you to submit through the, the discussion um, window um, that we have uh, through the, the, the Zoom um, uh, tool. So um, this discussion will last for about an hour and a half. Um, and it was intentionally um, that long because uh, we want um, everyone to be able to speak out their minds and share insights with us uh, rather than you know racing to keep up the time so this will be a rather info informal decision uh, and you know i've asked people not to share slides <laughs> uh, to you know make this informal in an informal decision so uh, we'll start off with um a uh, short introduction by everyone, uh, and I will also ask Lucien to remove his moderator hat and to put on his um, member of a commission um, at the French um, government hat <laughs> uh, and share with us a few uh, insights um, from a let's say more government perspective, because there have been developments um, recently on this information specifically in France. Uh, and then we'll proceed to hearing from other, our three other uh, participants who are hailing in alphabetical, or, uh, alphabetical order um, from um, Vienna. So Michael is here. Uh, Mohamed is, I believe in London for the time being. <laughs> Uh, and uh, Victoras is, I believe, in Vilnius in Lithuania. Um, so, Lucien, up to you to kind of tell us more about the challenges um, and perhaps the solutions um, you are seeing from the French government in terms of how is it helping us approach, address, and make sense of um, informational threats at large. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rena, for giving me the floor. Uh, first, I'll, I'll uh, start saying that everyone in the room, you can sit around the table, obviously. If there is three seats, you are obviously welcome to, to sit around. Um, uh, indeed, uh, thank you, Rena. I'm a member of an expert committee with the French audiovisual regulator on on disinformation. Um, and it was quite an interesting experience indeed because regulating disinformation has a lot of implication for speech, but also for privacy. Uh, the ongoing dynamic in Europe in regulating disinformation is uh, focusing uh, basically on the balance between freedom of expression and cybersecurity as well as the, the resilience of society which is the topic of another workshop really in two days. Um, and in France, um, as a use case, indeed, we passed a, a law against the manipulation of information, which aim at tackling disinformation online and better protect democracy against 
hybrid uh, threats. The law is called the law um, on the fight against information disorder. It's been enacted on 22 December 2018. So it's uh, been already two years, uh, three years. Um, and that's uh, quite an interesting point because basically uh, the law creates a new range of duties uh, for online platforms, including an obligation to, to cooperate with the regulator and uh, it's been uh, put to practice. Um, basically, the idea of the law is to target the rapid spread of fake news online uh, with a particular attention to election campaigns, as you may uh, have guessed, either just before or during elections. Um, the law also cre creates a legal injunction allowing an interim judge to qualify the fake news and to order its removal as defined in an 8081 law on the freedom of the press, uh, following criteria of the fake news being manifest, disseminated deliberately on a massive scale and obviously leading to disturbance of the peace. Uh, another interesting point very quickly is that the law is also promoting a transparency obligation for digital platforms and a duty of cooperation for this platform and the compliance uh, with the duty is entrusted to the French Audiovisual Council, the Conseil Supérieur de l'Audiovisual, um, and um, the CSA, the, the French Audiovisual Council, had developed an innovative and quite a collaborative approach to fulfill its new duties including putting together a project team, which is now uh, becoming a new direction of the, of the regulator, and has put together an expert committee, uh, which I'm a member of, composed of 18 experts from different backgrounds to try bringing expertise to the council when fighting information disorder. Um, also, uh, to complete its duty, uh, the regulator also conducts annually an extensive questionnaire to cover reporting mechanism, transparency of algorithms, and uh, for example, information directly provided to end users of digital platforms. It's a quite a collaborative way uh, to do so. And um, also with the, uh, obviously the, the trend of legislation, both in France and in the European Union, uh, the regulator is gaining more power as it, content, uh, as it concerns content moderation. Thank you. Back to you, uh, Raina. Yeah, thanks for setting the scene. So the, the way why I asked Lucien to start off is, well, because he will then be um, um, taking over as moderator uh, to, to, you know, uh, to the in-person meeting, but also because framing that the, the question of information disor disorder, um, as he mentioned it, solely through uh, the angle of what can and cannot be said uh, is the way we have been talking about, um, well, handling the, in, the protection of information uh, today. And the, the, the reason, the rationale behind the proposal of this workshop was to kind of extend and go beyond that, that uh, small, if you like, or limiting definition and to say that, look, tomorrow we'll be having, um, you know, auto autonomous systems taking decisions on their own, but those autonomous systems, they don't magically train themselves. They need uh, training sets and for to compose those training sets, we need to ensure integrity and availability of information that is representative and adequate. And so we are not here talking about speech uh, as reflected through you know social media and so on. We are not we're talking more and more about information structured or otherwise and as a source for training of tomorrow's, uh, if you like, autonomous decision makers, uh, making systems. So, the, and this is where um, we kind of come on a territory that is a different one, which is the one of cybersecurity. Um, 
and which is basically of saying we need to protect assets. That's what cybersecurity is about. Um, and in those assets so far, uh, at least in the West, let's put it that way, we've been focusing pretty much on protecting information systems, but with a focus on the system rather than on the information. Um, uh, and we've been focusing quite a lot uh, about protecting infrastructures. Um, and at least uh, this technical view, this technological view uh, is starting to be um, perhaps a little, you know, sh short, um, given the challenges that we have today. Um, and Lucien already mentioned uh, one such challenge that we have today, which is hybrid threats. And so this is where, um, you know, we are going into something that has a much broader definition than just regulating speech, speech um, uh, on social media. Uh, or just protecting vital infrastructure. And so how are we going to kind of join those things and make a conciliable, if you like, between those two very different challenge topics? Um, because the, the, the way um, policymakers, researchers, and, and practitioners uh, from, from different fields of activity have seen the whole discussion stem and start coming around is about how do we um, manage uh, or you know, uh, peruse uh, digital technologies in the context of civil um, and military conflicts. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce us, uh, to introduce you, sorry, <laughs> to um, our guests today. Uh, so by our alphabetical order um, of the first name, <laughs> um, I'm starting with Michael, uh, who is hailing from Vienna. Um, so each of our guests um, will have the opportunity to uh, introduce themselves and to like within five uh, to 10, like really max 10 minutes. Uh, tell us more about where they come from intellectually, why they're versed or why they're interested into um, the multi-stakeholder discussion uh, that is going on around tackling hybrid threats and making basically cyberspace safer. Um, so our second guest today will be Mohamed El Dachshan. Uh, hailing from London for the time being, um, and you're economist by training, and um, with us uh, as well, hailing from Vilnius in Lithuania, is Viktoras Daukšas, like, correct me uh, if I'm mispronouncing uh, your name, uh, who is the director of Desinfo. Um, disinfoeu.org um, and he focuses uh, with his NGO on challenges in the Baltics and uh, some other countries um, including Georgia, Montenegro and Poland if I'm correct. Um, and yeah so Michael the floor is yours for your introductory uh, remarks. Wonderful thank you very much Raina I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Thank you very much for inviting me to today's workshop. I'm very excited to be here and to engage also in a discussion with all participants. I see that the room is already quite full, so I'm happy to see that there are also people who have been able to travel to Poland in person to attend this session. As Rana has introduced me already, my name is Michael Sinkanel. I am the deputy director of an Austrian-based think tank, the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. We focus on researching various security challenges in the setting of the European Union. We work closely with Austrian ministries, in particular advising the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs but are also closely related and collaborating with various European stakeholders. My role, my research role focuses on investigating hybrid threats, uh, in particular disinformation campaigns and cybersecurity. However, I must say that I'm not coming from a technical background. 
Uh, my background is in political science and peace and conflict studies. So I analyze the security implications that cyber security, cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns have on um, the European Union, the Austrian government in particular. And in analyzing these threats uh, for the last three, three and a half years, uh, I'd just like to briefly share a couple of thoughts uh, which are on the one side, probably going a little bit into the motives, the backgrounds of this information, also touching upon probably some more philosophical, psychological thoughts, uh, but will certainly paint a picture uh, within the realm of a new security environment that we still have to get uh, accustomed to. Um, so when looking at disinformation, we have to first acknowledge that it's nothing, nothing completely new. Disinformation was there for the last centuries, for the last millennia. I uh, very much like to quote at this point uh, a quote from Sun Tzu from The Art of War, which is more than 2,000 years, 2,500 years old, uh, where in this famous book he quoted that disinformation, misinformation, the ability to use methods of deception is very vital in any uh, sort of war environment and any sort of fighting. So the quote goes, when we're able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must impure and active. When far away, we must make the enemy believe we're near. And I believe this can be applied also to today's world. However, there has been some changes, changes over the past uh, decades, especially uh, with relation to the last couple of uh, years. Um, because in the past, spreading this information, of course, was very different than today. So the underlying factors, three uh, underlying factors that I'd like to briefly outline are the following. First, the speed and accessibility of spreading information online, both harmful and informative, truthful information has completely changed. It's now possible due to technological advances to reach a huge amount of people by relatively simple, relatively cheap means. And it has also led to the change in roles, in traditional roles of who is creating and who is receiving information. There was a shift today, basically online, especially on social media, everyone becomes a consumer and at the same time publisher or creator of information or disinformation. Second, uh, there is an increasing and undeniable dependency on online and digital technology. Uh, simply the fact that we are all uh, uh, joining this workshop together from various cities, I believe, is proof that um, the COVID pandemic has further accelerated also this trend. We're constantly in a private, in a personal, in a work environment related to dependent on technology and especially digital technology, online technology. And third, we are at the moment uh, in a stage where geopolitical tension is rising, where new forms of threats are emerging, uh, where unconventional areas of warfare are on the rise. Uh, uh, without going further into detail, uh, the current geopolitical environment between uh, the US and China, but also between European actors, Russian actors, uh, is increasingly uh, tense, if not to say hostile. This leads us to a new digital reality where due to these uh, underlying factors, there is growing interconnectedness between the digital and the physical analog real world. And these interconnectedness, this interconnectedness has implications um, and today we also see that algorithms prey on these developments, learn biases, behaviors from us that are constantly being produced and reproduced. So to sum it up, we are living in an area where, uh, where hybrid threats, where disinformation becomes a new type of, of accelerated warfare. And this, this area does not target uh, uh, tanks or is not involving the typical traditional means of warfare, air, sea, 
uh, and, and, and the maritime dimension, but is more going into the hearts and minds, into the thoughts, into the emotions, into the beliefs of people. So without becoming too philosophical, basically the concept of truth is tackled, uh, where people are disencouraged, uh, where to a point where the truth doesn't really matter anymore. It's becoming more blurred. Um, I usually try to refer to that psychological term, which is called gaslighting, uh, which means that uh, a victim is uh, trying to be targeted through deception, ultimately aiming towards delegitimizing personal beliefs, personal views, core values, to seeding seeds of insecurity, of doubt, of distrust. And this works very well at the time of a global pandemic of crises uh, in an area where uncertainty is something that we're constantly faced with and therefore flooding disinformation in that specific time has become as we have seen as research has shown as well over the last two years uh, very aggressive um, so where does the link to cybersecurity come into play? Um, I see it in, in various fields. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned before, this interconnectedness between the digital and the, the real world, but also in terms of uh, real tangible attacks that combine aspects of cybersecurity with disinformation, disinformation campaigns. For instance, hack and leak uh, uh, campaigns but also um, incidents where Twitter accounts were verified accounts as well have been hacked, where social media profiles have been hacked to create so-called zombie profiles that are then being abused and exploited to spread this information. Because if you're hacking uh, not any account, but a verified account, the uh, spread of this information, the ability to believe that person who is probably uh, uh, relatively influential is increasing. There have been substantial research that shows um, that various accounts have been targeted spreading this information, for instance, on the Hong Kong protests, but also on the outbreak of COVID-19, just to give a small example here. Um, looking in the future, um, Rana has already mentioned it briefly, we will be faced by algorithm by machine learning by artificial intelligence software that is further accelerating the current trends that we're currently seeing. Um, just to give you an example here as well, there have been already uh, uh, incidents where AI software was used to imitating voices of CEOs to demand transactions, but also as I have recently discovered, there have been also incidents where um, Governmental officials had Zoom conferences with other governmental officials from other countries just by figuring out later that the other party was actually not who they were supposed to represent. There were uh, the abilities also applying artificial intelligence software to recreate not only the voice, but also the appearance of another person, and especially in a digital environment. Uh, talking from one government to another that can be very tricky and then can be also used to spread uh, uh, harmful information. And harmful is probably the buzzword here because in my eyes, the intention behind spreading this information and the intention behind uh, targeted cyber attacks is very similar. And we can see that there are, con that there are uh, uh, similarities here, the intention to deliberately destabilize societies uh, to uh, disencourage trust, to undermine political trust, and to sow these seeds of uh, uh, uncertainty in general. Um, and therefore I see the intention, the motive behind this information attacks and, and cyber attacks as a common denominator that we have to keep in mind when analyzing current threats, but also when trying to figure out new means, especially whole of government, whole of society approaches um, to overcoming future challenges. I believe that it is absolutely necessary to include not only 
the traditional security environment and community uh, of ministries of defense, ministries of foreign affairs and tackling these issues, but also including scholars, academics, civil society groups, uh, companies, the private sector, but also experts in the field uh, like ourselves into creating a safer environment. So I'll just stop here because I believe I'll <laughs> otherwise go on for too long and I'm very happy to take questions and to engage in a discussion with all of you at a later stage. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, we'll have the, the opportunity to, to continue exchanging views um, uh, in, in, in short time. Um, and yes, I agree that um, intention and the question of trust uh, are quite paramount in, 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 that, uh, in that discussion. And when you said intention, uh, it triggered something that has also been, you know, in my, in my mind, that's also been one of the sources of, of this, um, of the motivation of this workshop today. And that's also why I invited Mohammed to join us. Um, quite often when, you know, when something happens, a lot of people ask who and, and how, uh, and in, an increasing amount of people start asking why, you know, that's the intention. And what we've realized, especially, you know, in the light of the recent um, revelations of the Facebook um, uh, whistleblower, uh, Francis Hogan, is that the design and the, um, the, the economic, if you like, or the fin financial gain um, of spreading information that may be harmful is paramount in tackling those, those uh, challenges. And I've realized that be it in the, disinformation space, be it in the cybersecurity space, we are still struggling with having this economic parameter uh, into uh, in mind and taking it into account. So I would like to turn to Mohamed, because uh, you're a trained, uh, you're a trained economist, so, uh, and you understand things I don't. <laughs> um, so tell us a little more about um, where you come from, and I know you focus, because we've worked together in the past, um, and I know you focus on emerging markets, um, as in African markets, but not only, um, and you also focus on the frailties of governance uh, and on the way, or ways actually, those frailties impact prosperity and uh, peace. So can you, with your background and your vision as an economist, tell us a little more on what fuels basically harmful <laughs> actions online. <laughs> oh, yeah, million dollar question. Um, yeah, I mean, might first... the easiest one for you, right? Uh, God, uh, well, first, thank you very much for having me. Thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I'm very sorry I can't be in Poland. Um, but I'm happy to join you from England, where it's definitely colder than, <laughs> than anywhere else it might be. Um, I am uh, I'm from Egypt, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to bring in some, some examples from the Arab or African region. Um, and, um, and then I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll bring in some of the economic aspects. Um, I come more, more to that issue from... So on the one hand, from my own background, my own activist background, shall we say, from an issue of, um, of freedom of speech, of online freedom of speech. Um, but then a lot of my work now, as you said, has to do with is development focused. Uh, and we're look, I look a lot at fragile states and post-conflict countries. And um, with the mass scale misinformation campaigns we've been having, it's, it's, been, it's been important and very concerning to look at, um, to look at the implications of this on, on, on what we, we could term fragile situations or fragile cases. Um, so, yeah, so if you'll allow me, I'll start with examples, I guess, from the region, and then maybe we bring in a couple of the uh, economic factors uh, involved. Um, so someone mentioned earlier um, misinformation in electoral campaigns, right? And I think the biggest case that we've seen this year on the continent was, uh, was in Uganda, uh, which had the, um, the specificity of being quite, quite diversified in, in the terms of, of the messaging. So it went from the political messaging and accusations of um, corruption and whatnot to the ad hominem attacks and to 
Uh, so for instance, there was quite a stream of, of, of the misinformation in, in that election that was all about um, attempting to defame the opposition candidate, a lot of it focusing on suggesting that he was gay, um, sort of taking advantage of, of an ambient uh, homophobia, I suppose, amongst the part of the electorate. Um, also, if you look at the misinformation surrounding the word in the war in Tigray in, in Ethiopia, uh, because this is something we've watched with a lot of concern, uh, with a lot of concern, it comes a lot of it. A lot of it is um, is diaspora generated, and um, it is and it has been amplified a lot by both the Ethiopian and at various times the Eritrean governments as well. Um, so, so you have this this confluence of um, of states involved in that conflict uh, taking advantage of of the tools that they have to amplify. Um, misinformation that likely they, they, they fomented. Sudan also is something that we've seen a lot, like spikes of misinformation at. Um, Russia has been uh, tagged for being behind quite a decent chunk of that um, in, with creation of a lot of pages uh, spreading news about, uh, well, how hyping Russia really as a good friend of Sudan. Um, supporting the establishment of a Russian military base in, in Port Sudan and occasionally accusing the government of being in the pockets of the Americans. Uh, probably one of one of the one of my favorite posts, if I can say that, has sort of the Sudanese prime minister as a vampire trying to steal Russian aid from a crying child. It's just the most dramatic and over the top stuff um, that, that we've been seeing in, in Sudan this year. And um, one thing noticeable about that one, that one was a Facebook page that was removed. Uh, the page was called The Better Past, um, which is a bit of a theme, actually, that we've seen in a number of countries, a lot of number of post-conflict countries, with a lot of the misinformation focusing on the nostalgia aspect of, well, whatever we have currently is bad. Uh, you shouldn't trust the transitional authorities. You should go back to the supporting the warlords, essentially, and the various actors who were in charge in the past. Um, Libya, and I'll, I'll probably use that as the last example, uh, just because it's, it's such a fascinating case. Libya is a country where a number, there's a multitude of, of, of countries that have, um, that have military and economic interests in Libya currently. And all of this is definitely complemented by uh, misinformation, right? So we know that Russia, Egypt, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, uh, at least, have been, have been implicated in um, in misinformation campaigns over the last several years. Um, and one an important concern in that is that with all the fake, all the fronts and all the fake organizations that, that they're pretending to be speaking on behalf, um, sort of the Libyan media consumer is aware that there's a lot of misinformation, right? Um, the problem is that that leads them to one, lose track of the genuine Libyan voices in that, uh, is one. And the second thing, to mistrust generally um, sort of the civil society as a whole. And that is that is something that that I think I think is warrants a lot of a lot of concern. Um, so, yeah, so there's been there's been quite quite a high level of and they've been learning a lot. Right. All of these actors have been learning a lot from their experience in Africa and the Middle East. Specifically, that's what I'm focusing on uh, that may or may not replicate uh, what you might have seen in other parts of the world. I'd, I'd love to learn more. Uh, but for instance, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing a model of franchising, right? So we know that um, Russia's internet research agency is paying local actors in the countries they operate in, um, paying them more actually than what it costs them to generate those campaigns out of Russia. Um, we've seen in cases where what I call sleeper pages, right? So it's pages that have been flagged um, for their connection for being founded by the same actors. But looking at the content, there doesn't seem to be much that would raise an eyebrow. So we're wondering whether that's a long-term investment in a way in building that brand uh, to potentially use it as, as misinformation, uh, as misinformation sources in the past. And um, the level of complexity and the level of organization that a lot of those state actors and para state actors have been reaching is impressive. Uh, we've probably heard a lot about the Riyadh troll farm, especially around the time of the murder of, of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, and a lot of that disinformation was generated by 
uh, yeah, what was called the Riyadh troll farm. Um, so people were paid essentially. I don't want to say an electronic army, but uh, because it's a bit more fancy because it is Riyadh after all. Um, but uh, yeah, but this is quite a level of sophistication. Another thing that I found was fascinating is that in 2020 we had um, we learned that um, that Hezbollah, the Lebanese political party, had their own misinformation training center, training academy, um, which uh, which was um, yeah, which basically trains people in well, the art of disinformation, fake accounts, image manipulation, etc. Um, this has been directly connected to uh, one of the organizations in Iraq, um, which is likely to be behind the the assassination of um, of Hisham al-Hajmi, who was was a an, an independent researcher, right? So, long several months of of disinformation about that about that person that culminated in him getting murdered, right? So the costs are very uh, clear. Um, I don't want to take too much time. So just on the on the cost issue, um, well, I mean there are two things here from 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 the side of from the side of, of the perpetrators, I suppose. Um, a lot of the from a lot of what we're seeing in 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 my part of the world uh, is state led, and the truth is the countries, you know, like their CPM isn't probably the most important factor in that case, right? Um, but and 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 that's a problem, and that's a problem because like an ideological misinformation is something that, especially when if it's coming on on the back of of a state actor, doesn't have the same challenges of financing that um, that a private one might have. But even the private ones are 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 seemingly doing very well, right? And we have some data that's not that is it's more from from like from the United States and from the United Kingdom, but. Um, the revenues that that people managing misinformation websites and whatnot can generate are uh, simply appealing from from a pure from a pure economic perspective, um, and and the more egregious the better. Um, there was Washington Post estimates I think around the time of the previous uh, American elections that. Um, Getting your fake, getting your fake news shared from someone within the Trump campaign could translate into roughly ten thousand dollars worth of ads, right? So if you get, and and so the economic incentives are at that level. So it it works both at the personal level and the pure, you know, how much clicks bring you, but also what are the long term, um, what are the long term benefits that that a country could obtain? That country like Russia, for instance, if we're talking about um, Russia advocating for their, you know, to convince the local population to allow them to open or to not object to opening a military base. Um, now, a question there, and I probably end on this point, and we can probably break down numbers a little bit more further, if you will. But um, the interesting thing that we're seeing is that a lot of that happens in countries, and it's done by foreign actors, right? Um, especially in developing countries. And the question is, how much of how much could those countries, uh, so the African and Arab countries in, in that case, how much space do they have to try to control that or at least try to push it back? And or even what incentive do they do they have to go after that? Um, because, you know, like we have the evidence that that um, that the Russian R, the, the RA folks are paying people, we're paying, we're paying people in, in Sudan, I believe. Um, to manage their 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 pages, so these are local perpetrators within Sudan, and why is why are governments not particularly uh, going after them? And it comes down to the fact that very simply they benefit from that too, and the people designing the content to make sure that um, you know some of the some of the some of I let me sort of phrase that sentence um, that in many of the countries. Um, Many African and, and, and Middle Eastern countries, um, a lot of the foreign propaganda or the foreign misinformation also benefits local some local actors sufficiently that they have no incentive to try to curtail that. Right. So whether it's the same messaging or whether it's complementary messaging developed simply to make it uh, to make it slightly more friendly or more appealing to those political actors. Um, so that's sort of hybridization of messaging is is what allows allows that to um to endure um so i think i should probably stop here i think that's been like eight minutes or so um so i thank you all for your time and i'm more than happy to come back in the discussion
Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, it was a very rich, uh, and I will definitely get back to the whole franchising um, and and um, cost effective, you know, implication of foreign actors um, uh, in in the Q and A uh, session afterwards. Um, but the, I would like now to turn to Victor Haas, and you know, we, you said something about nostalgia looking at my notes, the better past. <laughs> so, and, you know, uh, both, like, I come from Eastern Europe as well, and Victor Haas comes from Eastern Europe as well, from the Baltics. Um, and I think we've seen our fair share of <laughs> the better past, um, you know, online, in newspapers and so on, and in political campaigns. Um, what, what is very interesting also in the Baltics is that we have seen in the, in the recent months a huge, um, yeah, uptick, if you like, of events and tensions arising um, with uh, the, the, the challenges posed by the Belarusian management, if you like, channeling of uh, migrants through Lithuania to Poland. Um, so this is also something I think Victor Haas will touch on a little bit. Um, but more generally, can you tell us um, from your work, from where you are, because um, I know you have um, civil society actions, but also you interact with people from Ministry of Defense, from NATO and so on. Can you tell us from that perspective, um, how is this challenge of poisoning content, of poisoning interactions, of promoting uh, harmful content online, uh, seen and how it is acted upon, if at all, uh, from from where you work, from from your area. Up yeah, thanks, Reina, for for introduction. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I'm Viktor Dokshas, head of debankeu.org. Uh, my background is applied physics, uh, so I'm coming with a technological background. And uh, for the last fourteen years, I worked uh, with uh, media and media technologies. So I do really understand uh, how the backend things work, how uh, how the inter infrastructure is built, um, uh, how GDPR works, and uh, what's allowed and what's not, and uh, how media in general operates. Uh, so I'm having like having this background and worked with the uh, biggest media companies in the Baltics here. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, also, some context of Lithuania uh, is countering disinformation for at least 20 years. So 20 years ago, the first academic community started to kind of uh, do academic work, debunk uh, these disinformation cases and present them. Uh, 14 years, Lithuanian military stratcom works uh, to debunk those cases. Uh, the media joined, uh, then we kind of evolved out of all of this uh, as an organization uh, countering disinformation. <clears throat> What's really important, I think, is that... Um, we need to speak about the methodology. How do we actually analyze this information? And how do we kind of uh, agree on things, uh, how they should be and uh, what, what should exist and what shouldn't? And uh, last uh, few years, uh, we have worked with a, a team of five professors and our kind of large team of disinformation analysts uh, to practically analyze and also to develop a method methodology for disinformation analysis. So we kind of analyzed everything, all, almost everything that exists <laughs> in English language that you can find in the academic world, uh, books and everything in, in the last 20 years. So, and, and from that, we developed a methodology. Uh, and so now it's a, we, we call it the three-step analysis, uh, starting from the source analysis, analyzing every source, uh, communication actor participating in these disinformation campaigns. Then we assess every content piece separately. Uh, so trained analysts are reviewing those. And, and then we assess the circumstances or the context in which this is being spread and why this is actually happening. Uh, and I think that is a really important thing. Uh, and in today's discussions, uh, kind of uh, from our analyst perspective and, and professors and academic community, we should really agree to stop using fake news as a, as a, as a buzzword. It's not a term, it's um, academically kind of a nonsense thing. So it should be removed uh, from all the communications. And uh, so uh, I think it's a, just avoid it. So, uh, two terms that are actually really useful. It is disinformation and misinformation. And we have to be very clear uh, what is the difference between them. <clears throat> and the difference is just the intent. 
it, is this just an honest mistake of spreading or amplifying some false content? Or it's actually uh, kind of a systematic uh, way to spread disinformation, to spread and deceive the citizens and all the who are being targeted with that information campaign or information operation. So uh, there are more terms, but uh, they, are, they are less practical. Uh, these two are very easy to remember and very easy to use at large scale analysis. Uh, kind of running, uh, I will jump in also in, in all the manufacturing migration crisis, but I think it's important also like to understand that uh, with the current amount of the flow of information to analyze this uh, with just a naked eye and, and the computer and, and any number of analysts, it's ineffective, it's, it's, it's really hard to do. So you need some kind of process automations and uh, methodology helps to do that well. So methodology allows to for more people collaborating together, uh, synchronizing so they could talk to each other and reproduce the same results uh, from the same analysis uh, with different people, which is a kind of a really big thing. And then uh, we kind of work a lot to kind of develop the infrastructure which we, in which we can automate the processes. We can support the analysts and make the analysis quicker. So that worked really well. Uh, for example, now we monitor like 3000 disinformation outlets, 3000 websites and thousands and thousands of groups and pages that are spreading disinformation in social media. Uh, only those websites, they produce uh, two to three million content pieces every month in 32 languages. And we are kind of analyzing how they are kind of systematically deceiving citizens all around the world in many languages and running these information operation campaigns. Uh, speaking more generally, I think it's important to think that, uh, so there are these super spreaders or super spread events. Uh, so the big disinformation campaigns or the hybrid attacks uh, that are kind of part of the hybrid warfare. Uh, so targeting those could kind of solve a big part of the problems around the world, uh, connecting to information operations in general. Uh, so. Our recent work, uh, so we are really heavily working on this manufactured migration crisis in the Baltic states. And it's really important to note that it's manufactured. It's not a real migration crisis as how it's tend to be portrayed. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, last year's reached elections in Belarus, uh, presidential elections, and Lukashenko still uh, kept kind of his seats, even though illegitimately. Uh, sanctions were imposed seven months, none of the EU leaders uh, communicated with Belarus. And then in May 28, um, Mr. Lukashenko announced that he will start to flood uh, Europe with drugs and migrants and they will not control the border. Uh, then July 1st, um, uh, they announced that uh, there will be a visa-free uh, uh, kind of regime for 73 countries from the Middle East and Africa. Uh, and then we started to see kind of huge flow. Uh, so in Lithuania, there were more than 4,000 migrants who crossed Lithuanian border. Uh, big part of them are economic migrants uh, that were kind of deceived by the regime, uh, kind of selling these, what's called a package deal. So they are selling uh, and visas included, uh, flights included, taxis from the airport to Minsk, then to the hotel then the other taxis to the market to buy all the sleeping bags, batteries and other equipment uh, to even attack uh, the border wall. Uh, and then they are also, it, the service is also included to bring them directly either to Lithuanian or Polish border. So this is an organized uh, migration crisis and uh, Frontex have proved that uh, Der Spiegel and Dossier Center, a verified report provided the documents, the leaked documents, that showed how Belarus presidential office uh, cabinet signed the agreements to sign uh, kind of um, uh, contract an Iraqi person to sign agreements uh, to increase the number of flights uh, from Baghdad to, to Minsk. Then the other agreements to kind of transport migrants coming uh, to, the, uh, to the airport, to the uh, city and then to the border. So there's a lot of evidence already kind of um, proving and, and Starting from the um, uh, 8th of um, November, there was uh, this a huge attack of the Polish uh, border with more than 2,000 people. And uh, 
in in four days, uh, there was 80 18 more times uh, increase in kind of disinformation spreaders that we are monitoring. So this started to produce just a week later, 18 times more content to kind of deceive uh, people and, and spread disinformation about that. Uh, we kind of uh, reported a lot of the cases that we find, and we do find actually a lot of cases. Uh, so we monitor uh, this crisis in 10 languages in multiple countries from which migrants are coming, the mainstream media there, uh, hostile media in the Baltics, countries connected with the Kremlin and Minsk. And we run this analysis and every month we spot uh, around 1000 cases of mess and disinformation. Uh, the, the latest kind of uh, big thing that happened, and we were reporting to Facebook all of these cases of uh, kind of disinformation or, or really illegal content that is being published on Facebook. And finally, Facebook um, uh, started to remove those accounts. And I think that's the first time in the Baltics that that, that happened. And Facebook uh, directly attributed 41 Facebook accounts for Instagram accounts and five Facebook groups and directly attributed to Belarus and KGB. So that is a big deal. Uh, that, uh, that is uh, another evidence. Uh, so not having the border control involved, not, uh, not also having Belarus presidential office involved, other institutions, but KGB now also as well. Uh, also, we see huge involvement from Kremlin's media. So there's a big support uh, coming from, uh, from Moscow to support all these events happening uh, in Belarus. So these co campaigns are coordinated. Uh, we analyze them. Uh, you can read our work in debunkeu.org website. Uh, we publish quite a lot on that. And yeah, just remember, this is a manufactured crisis and it's a not a real one. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Victor. Has um, a lot of concrete examples, uh, and it helps indeed shed light on this ongoing situation. I mean, the life cycle, the sorry, the news cycle has passed a little, but the, the situation is still there. Um, just a reminder to to um, anyone uh, who is willing to ask questions, if you are online, please do so. Um, on the chat function in Zoom, if and if you are on site. Um, reach out to Lucien for, uh, for, for transmitting the question, or I think the, the mics can be open uh, as well on site. So, you know, raise your hand or make yourself known that you have a comment or a question. Um, I, I have a, a few questions of, of my own listening to you uh, with, with those introductory remarks that are really rich in, uh, in learnings and in, in examples. Um, from, from what I'm hearing, um, we are in a situation where um, we have gone beyond, you know, individual action. We are in a, in a situation where each user basically can have a, an activating um, activating crowds uh, action. Um, and so we are much more talking about the sum of individual actions um, rather than a single uh, a single one. Um, and what I heard a lot is the question of trust. Um, and to me, this is perhaps one of the most important ones. Um, Michael, you mentioned something about it. Um, Hamed also spoke about it, and, and Victor has also spoke about it in, from different angles, you know, from who is speaking, how the message is transmitted, and so on and so forth. But what I'm thinking of in connection to, to cybersecurity is, for example, the questions of phishing, you know, of um, stealing identities online or luring, uh, you know, individuals into giving their um, um, passwords, uh, identifiers, and so on, um, against their will, uh, and then usurping um, the actual, actually, the, the addresses of legitimate uh, users that the victims know and trust. And so this, in that, in, in that aspect, we are clearly having a, a, a coincidence, if you like, or a crossing of um, cybersecurity aspects and this information where trust uh, basically makes the harm possible. Um, because I can compromise a lot of people's accounts, but if I don't do anything with that, then we, we are still kind of in a, in a safe 
place, if you like, quote unquote, uh, multiple times, right? Uh, um, but so, so Michael, I would like you to to kind of and the others, please um, jump in, uh, chime in um, when you uh, you feel like you have things to add. I'd like to ask you about this uh, question of trust. Um, how do we? kind of try to handle this because very clearly, you know, and, and Victor Haas was very explicit on that, like fake news doesn't exist. It's not the proper word of qualifying anything. Um, and you hint, like hinted towards the fact that, you know, it's facts are equally and interpretations are equally um, important, increasingly, uh, regardless of, you know, how, you um, close there to reality. <laughs> so how in that situation, um, with the tools we have, uh, or we still don't, how can we basically address the question of trust here? Uh, what do we need to do? Because clearly, policing speech, dubbing things fake news and so on, that's not enough. That's not appropriate in the sense that it's not efficient. So what would be efficient for you from both a, well, a tool perspective, if you like, and the policy perspective? I think that's a very relevant and definitely at the same time, very difficult question to answer, especially in a short time. Uh, and I hope that uh, European stakeholders and uh, democratic governments around the world are asking themselves that same question as we speak. Trust is something that needs time to be built and can at the same time be destroyed in seconds. So it is a very fragile concept and it goes also hand in hand with not only what do I believe in, but also what do I think is true? So I believe trust and truth is something that we should think as uh, combined in that sense and both aspects uh, which are of course related to our feelings to our feelings of belonging are targeted by disinformation systematically as we've heard multiple times uh, not randomly uh, the example that was given by Mohammed of um, tackling an opponent a political opponent spreading this information that he is homosexual taps into homophobia. We have seen similar accounts as well uh, in Europe, uh, in more uh, traditional environments uh, where religion plays a more important role than probably in Central or Western European environments, where the same tactics were deployed to spread new, to spread disinformation that the COVID-19 pandemic was also transmitted, uh, especially through uh, people who are homosexual, which is, of course, complete nonsense. However, these feelings, these uh, 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 disinformation clusters resonate with the people and are deliberately targeting special groups of people and their core values. Um, and therefore, you create this environment of fear. This way, that therefore, you create an environment of distrust to a point where you distrust everyone and everything. Uh, where we then go into a field which also plays an important role, and I'm a little surprised that we haven't mentioned it so far, but probably will come up in the discussion, of conspiracies and conspiracy mythology almost. I don't want to call it theories because theories can be disproven and with these uh, kind of complete nonsense uh, 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 conspiracy tales and stories is not the case. So looking at QAnon, I think it's a very fascinating phenomenon to analyze. How do you get people to distrust everything completely that is under the umbrella of, uh, 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 let's say, logical senses and, and go to, to, to theories, not theories, but stories and tales that are, yeah, as we all know, uh, uh, out of the world, it couldn't be better made in a science fiction movie. So I believe trust is a very important aspect to tackle. However, I don't have now the silver bullet and I don't believe that there is one uh, to answer that question holistically, how can we build trust in a society that is constantly systematically targeted uh, 
by disinformation, by spreading a distrust, how can we build up that trust from within? It's very hard to answer in my eyes. Oh, and I was hoping you would <laughs> provide us. No, just kidding. Um, thank you. Thank you, Michael. This is... Um... <laughs> I mean, it's super complicated. Otherwise, we would have all the answers by now and we would just, you know, go on with our days if there were a simple answer. Um, I have a few more questions and there are there is one more in the, the chat, but I believe Lucien has someone in the room. Yeah, Do exactly. You, yep. Yeah, exactly, Raina. Do you, uh, we have some people interested in the room to react. I have one of my right. Uh, I give you the floor. Yeah, uh, press yeah, the you press the button and... Okay, uh, hi, name is Arek. I'm from Poland and I am active internet user. And I would like to ask about some something which was already brought up by Mohamed. And I'm speaking about uh, foreign influence because I believe both Reina and Victoras, hailing from Eastern Europe as me, can uh, agree that foreign influence is not uh, not uh, which is unique to Arab world and developing countries, but it is also present in the, for example, uh, Eastern European Eastern European post-Soviet bloc. And I would like to ask, especially about the main problem of why it is, it is so hard with fighting with this uh, this kind of disinformation, and I think it's because of the form. Um, because fighting with uh, fa uh, this um, disinformation in press articles and uh, politician tweets and Facebook uh, Facebook content is one thing, but the form, which is uh, most appealing to the young generation, is in form of memes, in form of content, in form of uh, videos in YouTube and other services. And it is um, very hard to tackle on this problem because every time they're very often humorous in nature. So restricting the, this form of uh, content is hard because tackling it uh, is very often seen as uh, uh, restricting freedom of speech. So my question is how we can act actively fight against the, this soft form uh, of disinformation, not in uh, press articles, which can be um, thought of with uh, fake news policies, which, has, which are applied by some countries, but this, well, this newly very fluent, very unique form of spreading uh, disinformation in memes, for example. Thank you. Um, I'm seeing Victor Ras has raised his hand, but Mohamed, do you want to take this one? Because you were explicitly mentioned. If not, I'll pass to, to Victor Ras. Um. I mean, first, Alec, thank you for your comment. Uh, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to bring a small piece of the of the answer, if I if I may try. Um, so you're absolutely right that the experience of foreign actors is um, is global. Um, I think I think I mean it was it was seen most globally when we're talking about interference in the American elections in 2016, right? I think that was that's when it was really front page news. Uh, so, so the foreign aspect is, is is interesting, but I think your point is really interesting about sort of the format of the messaging, and that um, that kind of reminds like that brings me back to another example. I think I think it was a Cold War example, um, and I think it was mentioned by Brian Klaas, um, who's a political scientist um, here. Um, and I think the and that's and I'm mentioning that reference because I may not be entirely correct on the details, but it was basically uh, one an instance of of fake news where um, the Americans were generating were generating a radio um, a radio station, um, and uh, one of the way which which included a lot of fake information. Um, but they were very keen on trying to make sure that the information was as local as possible to the extent that at one point in time, they would literally cross the border, uh, go into the neighboring village on the other side of the border just to get a copy of a phone book. So they would be able to reference actual people who live in that area. And I, that's, that, that to me was fascinating because it's that hybridization of the messaging, which is including the 
um, the incorrect information in the midst of something that is correct. And it's, it's that formatting, especially if you go at a localized level, uh, that makes it even the, like all the more believable. Um, and of course, that brings us into the discussion of how much hyper-targeting you can do with advertisements and whatnot. But uh, yes, the formatting of the messaging, going very local and merging the real with the untrue is uh, probably the most potent combination that I can see. So that's my, my bit. Thank you. Victor Ras, I know you had a, a, a comment as well. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, disinformation and inf information operations, um, it is a broad field. And uh, uh, it can take basically two perspectives, either to com complicate or simplify. And I mean, that uh, it's, uh, it's impossible to solve all the problems at the same time. And uh, we need to somehow prioritize where do we place our uh, actual efforts and resources and where do we concentrate to kind of make the impact. And I think that uh, from prioritization perspective, there's, there are some problems that are actually worth to be solved, and there are some others that are worth less to be solved. So uh, taking an example of cyber uh, attacks and disinformation combination. So the ghostwriter campaign uh, that is taking last five years and currently uh, have been previously attributed uh, in the way uh, to Kremlin, but now it's attributed to an office in Minsk and from which these uh, operations have been run. And uh, this is a very clear example that uh, clearly is uh, uh, illegal. Uh, so it's not only illegitimate, it's actually illegal because they were, they hired a team uh, who started to hack uh, websites, media websites in the Baltic states, either media websites, uh, they have been able to kind of hack a uh, nuclear power plant, uh, uh, organization website to post uh, some fake content there. But what is uh, really sophisticated, uh, we, we, when we see the campaigns that they are, they are very well integrated. So they use uh, hacking as a method. They, they use social engineering as a method. They use email spoofing when um, and emails are sent in the other person's name looking from the same email uh, and they combine those. So they, they map out the actors uh, working in the Baltics. Uh, they implant the fake article uh, in, in the media outlet. They then use email spoofing to add a link in, in, in that, uh, uh, with that article in that spoofed email and sends out this to institutions and media and kind of attempts to create some kind of form of crisis. So this happened multiple times uh, in the Baltic states and also in, in Poland as well. So this is a very clear uh, influence operation with um, uh, also possible attribution. And so this is a cre clearly uh, illegal act. So these kind of acts should be forbidden. And uh, uh, it's just a, probably a political will question and also how to frame it. Other examples of uh, manipulated social media accounts or manipulated social media algorithms uh, or manipulated comments and under the international biggest media outlets around the world. So having manipulated public opinion uh, in social media or in those comments is clearly again, uh, illegitimate and also illegal. So they are sending the troll armies to kind of polarize the communities, uh, creating a fake accounts, managing them with the troll factories or sock puppet accounts in a more automated or semi-automated way. So these are, these should be actually illegal. So we don't want to create and uh, live in some kind of virtually created world, which looks like a kingdom of mirrors where we actually cannot understand what's actually happening. And uh, so a basic question should be like, if, uh, you know, if there are a lot of things that are illegal and uh, uh, doing offline. And still uh, in online, uh, all of, a lot of those things are actually legal. So the question is, why do we treat uh, digital space so differently uh, from, uh, from the offline world? So uh, even just connecting those two things, uh, we could start uh, to solve these problems. Even if uh, you know, someone would be speaking outside to 1,000 people, we would never consider this to be uh, a kind of private conversation. But if we take social media uh, and there's a group of 10,000 or 100,000 people, 
the admins can change the settings and make that group private. And then organizations as ours are not allowed to kind of an analyze the content. So how so? How a group of hundreds of thousands of people online uh, can be a private group when there's so many contacts there. So just kind of um, uh, bringing these similarities to offline and online would, would actually help and just target and kind of resolve the problems of uh, manipulated comments, manipulated social media accounts. And this is quite easy to do. So it is, it is quite easy to kind of create regulation to, to pressure big tech. So these fake accounts would not, would stop existing. Thank you. Thanks, Victor. Um, so I'm seeing questions coming in, uh, in addition to mine, to mine. So there was a question in the chat, um, so I'm reading it. Are there any disinformation campaigns the speakers can recall or currently see unfold whose topics have been so politically charged that disinformation researchers decided to stay silent and self-censored themselves for their own protection? Uh, meaning, does the field have a preference for calling out the easy and obvious disinformation campaigns while shying away from tackling the hard ones? Any testimonials about this one? Um, it's... I don't recall something like this. Perhaps think... things, yeah, that have gotten less coverage in mainstream media than, than they should. Um, but go ahead. Yeah, I can give a quick comment. So uh, I think there's a lot of cases that uh, are not analyzed. And uh, so the ba basic thing is that uh, we need to understand how much resources there are for this type of analysis. Just uh, compare, uh, so RT, one, they are kind of also the, the big spreaders owned directly by, by, by Kremlin and, and Russia today spreading disinformation ca cases and having uh, a yearly budget of more than 1 billion euros. And then in the European uh, Union, kind of, kind of uh, the budget, a yearly budget to kind of counter academically and as fact checkers, disinformation, it's 43 million. So th this is just an example of comparison to understand like how many disinformation cases and campaigns are not analyzed because the, the, the kind of resources are not dedicated. So I think we can find the answers there. Thank you. Michael, Mohammed. Any comment to this one? Specifically, nope. No, I agree. I would not say that shying away is uh, probably the right term. I would definitely agree with uh, Victor us that it's simply the resources that are limited. But I also am not aware of any disinformation campaigns where researchers have shied away due to their own protection or self-centered themselves, no. Yeah, same. It's more a question of means, or you also have the, the, always the, the balance to strike. Where, like, do you talk about this? It's so low, you know, uh, levels of noise, if you like, that if you talk about it, you'll basically push it to the fore and give it much more visibility than it would have had if nobody talked about it. So it's always a very complex juggling around with what do I do with it, uh, provided you know people operate uh, with illimited funds, which is definitely not the case. Um, there, there is another question uh, on Zoom. Uh, Lucien, do you have a question from the room? Yes. I, I'm not uh, forgetting you. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yes, Raina, uh, I have one question on my left. Please uh, take the floor. I'm Nagendra Lamsar, Deputy Attorney from Government of Nepal. I want to uh, small query. Is it necessary to address or regulate with joint effort this information as a serious cyber threats relating to cyber security? Can you repeat the last part? Uh, is it necessary to address or regulate with joint effort this information as a serious cyber threats relating to cyber security. Mm. Thank you. Guys, Michael, Mohammed, who wants to take this one? Just briefly, yes, I believe we should, uh, simply because of the arguments that we have brought forth, that there are certain correlations and the motives and the means and the tactics 
of uh, cybersecurity, cyber attacks, and disinformation campaigns. I see some clear correlation uh, in all these fields, tactics, motives, means, um, and therefore I believe we should have more coherent and more broader approach to tackling disinformation uh, as a new area of cyber threats. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, on Zoom from Luis Eduardo, uh, who says, I'm a Brazilian Internet Society Youth Ambassador, and I'd like to ask the following. Cybersecurity is often associated with the suppression of freedom of expression. For instance, the Cybersecurity Treaty that will start to be discussed in 2022 has received oppositions from human and digital rights organizations. In this sense, how can we create a policy framework that provides at the same time security and reduces the risk of undermining fundamental rights? Uh, I, I kind of have a comment on this. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, we speak about information on a very large scale. It. And uh, the only way to create uh, a smart policies is to have the data sets of previous disinformation cases and kind of uh, work out and challenge the suggested policies uh, with those cases. So uh, this kind of uh, then uh, actually uh, an effective law uh, could be presented. And on the other side of the um, uh, civil society activists and others, should present the other side cases. So, you know, taking the kind of data-driven approach uh, for policy development, it can actually achieve a really effective, uh, effective way. So I think that is uh, the future way to go. And uh, kind of the question is how to create these data sets. And for example, we work a lot on, on that to kind of develop these data sets, have these examples, and then have a very kind of targeted and um, uh, deep discussions about those cases. So I think we need to go from uh, this theoretical level uh, and speaking very broadly and very kind of vaguely into having the specifics of cases and then think uh, how uh, the law should be actually implemented so it would be actually effective. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's, that's an interesting question because it brings us to many other realms of activity, if you like. I mean, we've been, uh, you know, as, as a community, uh, generally, we've been advocating for opening up data, public data, for opening up uh, more recently algorithms. Um, and there are, you know, developments, especially in Europe, in the, in the EU, but not only, on um, greater transparency to uh, political advertisement especially if it's targeted at you know uh, under age or uh, or more broadly uh, at people um, on social networks so this is um, this is of course transparency and accountability are um, let's say a precondition for stability be it in the cyberspace or, or elsewhere um, which cannot be divided because our lives are connected lives. So <laughs> cyber stability is, you know, a whole of society challenge since it is stability for all of us. Um, and I would have a question because uh, there are two questions slash comments um, uh, on the chat that basically ask how do we um, handle, how do we basically, you know, mitigate um, uh, the, the, the the danger of informational disorders and a lot like the two comments point towards um, education. Um, and where I'm adding in a throwing in a question and this time it's towards Mohammed, the specific one is um, what is the business model of truth? Like, you know, we <laughs> We, we, we've been discussing how information disorders are harm, harmful, that of course intent matters to decide um, what to do with that, uh, with that thing. And of course we cannot just push up on enter or whatever button and poof, challenge solved. And so since, you know, in, in so many countries, foreign actors, foreign operators of uh, harmful information can 
have a license to operate because they are bringing in, you know, financial benefits uh, to, to, to people who are uh, impoverished or otherwise disadvantaged. So what is the, you know, and we are arguing that we need to push forward policies based on truth. So, and on transparency and on accountability. So I would like to ask, well, Mohammed, go ahead because you've been a little bit silent in the past minutes, but uh, everyone chime in. What is the business model of truth and transparency <laughs> that can, you know, kind of overcome <laughs> what we have now? Okay. Uh, well, allow me, uh, allow me to say two things. I mean, I'll, I'll come to that. Just one, one thing before that, since a lot of the discussion was about um, misinformation and phishing. Uh, and then there are a lot of comments about digital literacy uh, as a tool to fight that. Um, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, thinking of that on a micro level, right? On the person level. And honestly, the biggest source of misinformation in my life is my aunt Sousen, right? I don't know about you guys, but Facebook, like WhatsApp family groups are a cesspool of misinformation about COVID, about politics, about everything, right? And everyone is an every and like everyone is 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 a professional and everyone is my is an epidemiologist now. But that aside, a lot of the people who are in charge of of who are responsible for this are also the main targets of phishing and whatnot, right? Um, and because like these are the kind of people, those somewhat gullible people are the ones that that you know, actors will, that negative actors will prey on and, and get them to click on, on, on the wrong links. And I don't know what the answer is. I mean, public inform, public education is very important, yes, but I, again, I don't really imagine my aunt Sausen spending more than 20 seconds learning something new. So that's, so really, I'm, I'm genuinely, it's hard to, to think of that on, on the micro level. That's one thing, but a little more seriously, the tools that we're developing to combat phishing, like two-factor authentication, are a nightmare for those exact same people, right? Uh, because trying to get people to use their key and um, and enter a code from a text message every time they need to log into their Facebook account is complicated for a lot of those users, right? So I don't know what the solution is. I know that the tools that we're implementing to combat phishing are far below what we need and can't be replicated as they are on the business cost of on the business model of truth um i mean it's it's that's a really good question but first thing i can think of is that we know that the um the amount of energy expanded to fight bullshit is multiple than the amount spent to create that same bullshit um and and that kind of goes into a little bit into that that spending time to uh, create to debunk information and and time and money uh, is not necessarily something that's very lucrative. However, what we could look at is um, what is so it's not what is the benefit of truth. It's what's the cost of lies, right? So it's what is the what is the downside of that business model, and it's something that we're not very clear on because we haven't gotten to the point where. Uh, where we've systematized, and that applies to the private sector, and that applies to to governments, right? Um, so we know, for instance, that the private sector, like there's some analysis, there's some companies trying to break that down into what are the different costs of lies, and it goes from the cost of verification and triage to the cost of dealing with the crises that arise from uh, false positives and false negatives. Um, don't really have time to go into 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 detail there, but uh, how much it costs businesses that things are not as streamlined as as they should be because of all the new information they need to deal with, um, and something that I also find very fascinating is more generally speaking, what is the economic cost of manipulation, right? Uh, because we know that companies have lost shares, as sorry, company shares have lost value because. Um, because of because of, of of fake information about about their financial health, um, we know that I don't know, about ten years ago, oil prices went up by a full dollar, um, which had because because there was because there was a rumor um, like someone faked a minis a the identity of or spoofed the identity of of um, of a Russian minister and said that Bashar al-Assad had been killed, and that sent 
oil prices up. And that means that there's a whole bunch of countries around the world that ended up paying that much money because just to, you know, um, and so, so if we get better at understanding, so I don't know what the business of truth is. I think that if, I think that we're kind of screwed because um, on this particular approach, because it's very hard to generate, um, to generate, I guess, financial value from sharing correct information, which is what we assume to be the default. Um, however, I think that if we start flipping that backwards and thinking of what is the cost of uh, what is the cost of lies and how that affect you know what is the money that is being spent to mitigate that what how we can get that money and actually reinvest that into uh, into proper regulation and whatnot. Um, I think that that might be the approach that I would favor. So let's put it this way. Thank you very much. Thank you. You do have a talent for getting yourself out of my questions. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I did my best. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you. Um, I'm looking, we have three minutes before we are cut off. Uh, I know there are a lot of questions. Please um, send them over um, and we'll try to kind of respond um, off session um, to the best of our abilities. Um, guys, 30 seconds each for conclusion. Um, a tweet, if you like, <laughs> you know, uh, go ahead, Michael. Thank you very much. Challenging at last. Um, I am happy that people have been asking the questions of solutions because that was also something that I wanted to wrap up with. So just briefly digging into that topic, I believe we have to divide into long and short term solutions. Short term solutions would certainly include taking down sites, I believe it's effective not to have this information continue to spread online, but that can only be a short-term solution also to continue our analysis. On the long-term side, I believe that as it has been mentioned, media literacy and in including that into schooling, into primary education, into formal education is certainly absolutely necessary, but also including evaluating, reevaluating our policy strategies from a European, from a national point of view, simply because this is such a fluid environment that we constantly have to change our perception of what is at stake, what is in this field of new emerging technology, new emerging security threats, what is possible and how to readapt our own policies and strategies to mitigate those challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Mohamed? A tweet. <laughs> uh, a tweet. Um, um, I mean, first, thank you for having me. I'm very grateful uh, that I got to share those few points. Just the the tweet would be that um, developing countries deal with misinformation in very. It's the challenge is very different, and potentially the uh, the solutions are as well. And therefore, when we're looking at that as a global question, it's important to remember that these regional and geographical distinction are important and we need to keep that in mind when we're developing solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Victor Haas, you have the Thank final word. Thank you for having me here. So uh, I would say that uh, analysis is kind of the first step uh, because with analysis and data-driven approach, we can actually have an impact. Methodology is the second thing uh, because without having a common methodology and common understanding how can we work together and collaborate? It's uh, kind of not possible. And the long-term approach is a kind of um, media literacy and education. And just to give an example, so uh, last year we did a bad news game, uh, uh, just a game, 15 minutes, that proves uh, you know uh, people to become more resilient uh, to disinformation. And the game was played by 118,000 people. So you can actually do, you know, these little actions working together, collaborating can actually bring. Now we started to do a course for civic resilience. So you can check that. It's just a 90 minutes online course and 1000 students are already testing that in English language. So thank you all. Uh, be safe. Have, have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, we'll be, I'll be adding all the links uh, that people have been either sending or ref referring to, uh, to the final report. Um, and time's up. Lucien, uh, over to you for, uh, for a final word. And I think we are off now. <laughs>
Clearly. Uh, thank you, uh, Reina. It's time is up anyway. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us, uh, the participants, the panelists, and uh, it was quite a great hybrid session. Thank you all.